Well, good evening. Um, I am so happy to be here to share my story with you. It's my story, but it's also your story because it is the story of people who came from a specific place in Ireland. Um, in this case, it's going to be on the border with Monaghan and Tyrone, but I also refer to uh, Roscommon, Leitrim and, and other uh, uh, counties as well. And they came to Providence. And so I'm gonna talk about uh, what happened, what their situation was in Ireland and what it was like in Providence when they were here. Um, there are a number of chain migrations. This particular chain migration is what I would argue is the most significant in size. About a third to 40% of all the people that came during the famine years and just after that came from this border between County Monaghan, the um, parishes of Errigal, True, and Donna, um, which I refer to the Barony of True. And we have a guest here I'll tell you about in a second from Emmyvale, and right across the border in the uh, parish of Clara, which, I, did I pronounce that reasonably well? <clears throat> it looks like Clara, but anyway, it's Clara, I think. Anyway, um, I'm referring to Brendan O'Neill, who, um, because I put this on the Facebook page for um, that part of Ireland, um, he lives in Provincetown, he drove down to this tonight. So he knows, um, I have a very good friend, now, my background is, my family was famine Irish, so if you're famine Irish, you know it's really hard to find cousins in, in, in Ireland. You can adopt them, but to really find real cousins. And um, Patty McQuaid, who, who Brendan knows, um, when my son and I and my father went to Monaghan in 2011, we went there to find out about our McKenna's, and the first guy, I rented bicycles, and this fellow named Patty McQuaid showed up with these two bicycles for, for Dan and I to ride. And, um, and I told him that I was interested in my McKenna ancestors. And he goes, oh, forget about it. Because half the people in this part of the world are either McKennas or they're married to McKennas. <laughs> I can't straighten them out in Providence. There were 29 heads of household on Federal Hill in 1870 named McKenna. 29 heads of whole household, but that didn't include the rest of the city or the, the towns outside. Um, anyway, it turns out that, that I, I said, well, you know, I'm also looking for my Dugan ancestors. And he goes, oh my God, my, my wife Bridget is a Dugan. <laughs> and it turns out that, that we're related and we've shown it through DNA that um, one branch of the family left. I'm gonna talk about the Dugans tonight. Um, so anyway, that's that's the connection. That's where it starts. There are other chains. Um, my mom's side, my, my, my cousin Martha Lenahan is here tonight. You may remember Michael, um, who is a great US, a great state senator in Rhode Island. Um, our ancestors come from County Roscommon, and a ancestor of ours named Patrick Carson um, left with a price on his head. Um, there was a guy named Major Dennis Mayen, who uh, famously uh, got rid of the people on his land by tearing down their buildings and putting them on boats, which had inadequate food and inadequate health, and um, hundreds died coming over. Um, Mayen later was uh, riding through um, within a mile or two of where Patrick Carson lived and was, was shot and killed. I don't care. My, uh, our ancestor Patrick was already in, in Burrowville at that time. He was living in Pasco and um, he, he had gotten out just before that. But I found the document with um, Major Dennis Mayen's uh, handwriting at the bottom saying that this man, our ancestors wanted. Anyway, let's get to this story here. So um, what we're talking about is um, greater true. And uh, uh, Brenda and I were talking about this because there's a def different definitions of true. But the, the um, Ergel True and Donna, those two parishes in the north of Monaghan. And there's also the Barony of Clara, which is right over the border near Ocha and Clara um, and Ochnacloy. Um, actually, I think I might be just outside it, but this is where, this was the centerpiece of where people came 
to Providence from. So three to four percent of Ireland's population lived there at the time of the famine in the 18, 1845 in the fall. Um, 30 to 40 percent of the Irish that came to Providence came from there. So I'm going to get into why it is that they that they came they came to Providence and why they came as a group. Um, yeah, I've got a quote from I would I've, I should have taken it out. I'm sorry. <laughs> Make reference to Scott Malloy there. Um, I also like the Patrick Kavanaugh uh, poem. Um, he loved his Monaghan, but um, the stony gray soil of Monaghan, you burgled my bank of youth. I mean, it was, it wasn't always easy there. Anyway, so um, I move ahead too fast, I glad we did. All right, so, um, one of the things we're very lucky about is we have, um, when, you, when you're doing Irish history research and you find material that's good, you're very lucky because it's very hard to find. And there were two really good studies done on County Monaghan, one by a guy named Coote in 1801, um, which pretty thoroughly described how people lived. Um, another one in uh, 1824 when the uh, uh, ordnance survey the British Ordnance Survey came through and they described how people lived, they described the clothes they wore, they described the food they, they had, they described the um, uh, types of work they did, the types of uh, uh, machinery they had, pretty primitive. And we also have um, a young woman named Groshaw who came in the early 20th century to live in the area. She came as a, uh, to look after the children in a, a very fancy house. And she was a photographer and she took pictures of these people. Now, I've been in contact with a lot of people who live in this area. Uh, Brendan is new to me tonight, but I know a few other people there. And I know some of them that are related to some of the people in these photographs. That's how close, I mean, you know, Ireland's a big place. Well, I live in Connecticut, which is really big. As, as a Rhode Islander, I can tell you it's really big. Um, but, but we're so lucky to have these photographs. Um, and you can see in them that even though it's many years later after the famine, that the um, way they lived was still pretty primitive. Um, people weren't wearing shoes. Uh, I love I these kids sitting in the shade of the, of the um, I'm not sure what you call those when you build this word, Rips. proper word. For, Rips. And the Ricks, thank you. And they're the, they're the children sitting in the shade. Um, and these, these are Rose's photographs and they're, they're just fantastic. You can also see from her photographs, even though this is 60 years after the famine, maybe 50 years after the famine, um, the houses are still primitive. The life is still primitive. It's so, I'm not trying to say nothing changed after the, the famine because it did, it changed profoundly when they lost so many people, but physically, they were still working in the same kind of way. Um, a lot of things had not changed in the area. Now, one of the things that um, distinguishes this area was the uh, home textiles, because not too far from here is uh, Lurgan and also Belfast, which were the centers of textiles in Ireland, the, um, of the industry um, in the late, uh, 1700s, and they needed um, finished um, yarn, and so it was very common for people to have even looms that have spinning wheels and looms in their houses. And so at nighttime, um, your ancestors and mine, if you came from this area, was sitting around, particularly the women would sit around at night, they'd get together and they would be doing this work and they'd be telling stories and they'd be singing songs and having a proper Kaylee. Um, this was the life that they lived. Um, but the farming families were, were living right on the edge of starvation. And when um, they lose this textile industry, uh, what happens is people have to leave at that point. This painting is, is quite rare and it's, it's, it's fantastic because it, it captures the, the look of that place. Again, another, um, another one of these little gems. The um, upper right-hand side is from the Typh Appointment in 1826, and it lists uh, my my great-great-great-grandfather James Dugan, 
who was farming six acres there. He was farming another three acres in another area. It sounds like a lot, um, but it took 10 acres or more to support a family because the, the agriculture was very primitive. The um, type of plotment, incidentally, they talked about the people being lazy and indolent, that they wouldn't keep their houses up. Well, if you did take care of your house, if you improved your house, it wasn't your house. If you improved it, your rent would go up. Every, every kind of incentive that people might have had to improve their lives was, was taken away from them. And we know also their education was denied them. Uh, the, the, having a priest in the area was, was terribly restricted. They, they had some, but not very many. Um, the culture was, was sucked out and also the language that was sucked out. Now, it's your, McCloskey is your, your uncle, right? Yeah, Seamus McCloskey in, in his book, Emmy Vale, Sweet Emmy Vale, talks about the fact that at the time of the famine, there were still Irish speaking people in this area. Um, not as many as in the West, but it was still, it's, it's a fairly, uh, it's a rural area. Um, it's not a central location, I don't, I think you can safely say. And, and so there were pockets of people still doing that. Um, one thing that I will mention from time to time is the Old Stone Bank project that, that um, three of us in this room are working on. We're, we're transcribing um, 50 years of records and giving very personal details. And I came across one where the fellow comes into the, into the bank and he opens up a bank account. And the, and the comment by the banker is that this man doesn't speak any English, he's yeah. Irish. Um, the, the, the population here also was, was among the, the most uh, concentrated prior to the most uh, dense in Ireland prior to um, the famine. Uh, County Armagh, which is right next door, which is basically Warwick, um, <laughs> was, 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 was the, the most concentrated. And the only reason that the north of, of Monaghan wasn't is to the west, there's some areas that just are not. Uh, very, very habitable to her. I mean, they're not, it's, it's not very good for agriculture, but it was, it was pretty tough. It's pretty crowded. Um, the lower, the lower right is um, uh, baptismal records that I, I found for the family. So here we are, we're at the, at this uh, confluence. Today, it's also the confluence between Northern Ireland and Ireland. Um, uh, incidentally, I, 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 as an aside, you had mentioned Bobby Sands, and Bobby Sands was elected to uh, the British Parliament, and he represent. He was elected by people on the Tyrone side of this little patch of land. In Ochnacloy today, if you go through there, you'll see a beautiful monument to to, to uh, Bobby Sands. Um, he wasn't from there, but they elected him to Parliament. So anyway, so so my my great 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 grandfather James Dugan and his wife Ellen McKenna, McKenna's Mary McKenna's, um, they were born about the same time that the um, Orange Order was created. The Orange Order was created only 15 miles from Dunalasset, the town land where they lived, and also at the same time, United Irishmen were gaining strength. This was a group that was pretty much started in, in Belfast and um, had people like uh, Wolftone um, and uh, uh, Theo Wolftone involved. And um, they were spreading through, through Ireland. And uh, again, uh, Seamus McCloskey, uh, your uncle, uh, said that by 1795, there was hardly a, a man in Northern, in Northern Monaghan who wasn't a member of the United Irishman. So you have this incredible situation. I mean, it wasn't, I'm not trying to say that we were worse off than any other part of Ireland. I'm just trying to say specifically what was going on in this place, because it was a specifically bad, bad place. Um, I found many records. If you go to Federal Hill Irish, my, my website, you'll find uh, articles written about some of the fights that happened, uh, where Orange, Orange Order guys would come through towns and, and pick up fights. Um, I'm not saying that the, the, um, that the uh, United Irishmen weren't up to getting into a fight either, but, um, but these guys would march through just as they do today with their little um, their drums and singing their songs about uh, King Willie. And um, it was, it was, a, it was a, con a constant thing. So there's, this is, this is 
one of the most famous events that nobody knows about, Laris Moore. It, it, should, it should be known. Um, what happened was, um, Scott was telling me earlier that his uh, ancestor was in, the, or I guess great-grandfather was in the British Constable, Constabulacy? He was, was a cop. Was a, I don't know yeah. if it was the Mullah Malloy. All right. <laughs> well, um, what they did is there was so much tension going on in Ireland that the British government, or actually it was the government in, in Dublin, which was the same thugs. Yeah. Um, they, they started, they put together the militias, they organized militias in all the counties, but not trusting that the people would be true to the, to the, to the crown, they sent the uh, militias to different counties. So the Monaghan County, Monaghan militia was sent to an area right near Belfast. And the word was that within the, within these, and it was young men who, um, just like in World War One and World War Two, young Irish guys, Part of the reason that they fought, a big part of the reason they fought for, for in wars was because they, they needed to make a living. They needed to take care of their families. And one way to take care of your family was to, to get involved in war. And so there were a lot of young men that were in, that joined the militia from Monaghan. And the word got around, somebody uh, told, the, uh, told the authorities that uh, there were a lot of people who were United Irishmen. And so they, brought all of the militia together. They brought other military people together to um, point rifles at them and said, if you're willing to confess, we'll let you go. We're not gonna, no problem. There were four men, four very young men who refused to. Um, Owen McKenna and Billy McKenna. And incidentally, when I mentioned McKenna, I'm not talking, I'm not talking about my family. I wish I was, but there are so many of us that it's, it's, but Owen McKenna and Billy McKenna, they actually grew up within two miles of my family's house and um, right, right on the Blackwater River, right on the border with, with Tyrone. Um, they were there with, along with Peter McCarran and Jimmy Gillen, who were just south of Emmyvale, is where they were from. This is all within a couple of miles of things. And they refused to um, give in. Their father, Owen, came, I think, something like 40 miles to, to give them strength, give them courage, give them um, support. And he was asked by the British authorities, please just get your sons to confess and everything will be fine. Well, they didn't confess. They were made to um, stand before a firing squad and they were all killed. And why this is not the most famous of the events, because this is only um, a year before the rebellion of 1798. Um, but at any rate, uh, if you live in the area, you know it. I know that uh, Jimmy Dugan, my ancestor growing up, and um, the other people in that area would have known, would, would have known these, these boys, at least known their families. So here are a few more uh, faces of the people from um, Monaghan. Uh, the fellow right in the middle is, um, uh, Cormac Holland. Um, he had a, a relative, he had a cousin by the same name, Cormac Holland, who was living in Providence in the 1860s. Um, the fellow in the lower left-hand corner um, is a guy, did I put his name down? I think, let's see if I, I, um, I don't have it right here, but um, his grandkids actually moved to Providence. So most of the people, these are all local people, you see the bare feet, you see the primitive uh, way of, of, of doing their, their business. You see the music. Um, they love to get together at, at, at square, at, um, where, where two roads would come together and, and have, have dances at night. Um, these people were our relatives for a lot of us. So there's a build up to the, um, the famine. Uh, when the famine hits in 1845, there were already uh, signs, people knew what was coming because I think it was in seven, uh, 1820 and 1821, there was a famine and things were pretty rough. And so in 1845 in the fall, the, the uh, potatoes fail and they fail pretty strongly in this area. Um, if you go to my website, I think I've got some of the statistics there, um, but at any rate, what happened was they had to decide what they're going to do. Now you already heard me tell you what 
uh, Dennis Mayen decided to do, and that was to clear out his people, put them on boats and just get them away and consolidate the land and use it for, for growing large crops or growing animals. Um, the sheriff of Monaghan, who was uh, appointed by the crown, and you see in the threes of the, of the building, you see the symbol of the crown. There it is. There's uh, uh, British power where law is decided in County Monaghan. Um, he called together all the landowners. Ancatel was, was our landlord, landowner, landlord. And they got together and um, he, he said, we're the best judges of what to do. And they talked for a few hours. Now, what's really interesting here is that this was a, I found this document that I don't think anybody, any local historians in the area had found. And it was right in plain sight because the Northern Standard, which is the newspaper for, kind of for Northern Monaghan, they had a reporter who said he got wind that this meeting was gonna happen with the landlords to decide what to do about the famine. And, uh, the shortage of food. I, I, I use the famine because that word, right, people understand what I'm saying right away. So I could talk about it in a lot of different ways. But anyway, um, he knew it's going to be a meeting. And so he went and he said, can I, can I attend? And I said, no, you can't attend. And he must have been very persuasive because they let him attend. And he took notes and it was published over the pages with all the words, the quotes of what these people said. Now they talked about the fact that there were abundance of potatoes. And it was true because farmers would take who had potatoes that were healthy, would put them on their wagons and they'd bring them into a town to sell. And at the end of the day, because people didn't have anything to pay for them with, they'd take them home. So there was abundance of food. Forget about the, forget about the, Forget about the animals that were there because they were raising, raising cattle. Um, but these guys talk about it. They say, well, you know, it, it's not, it shouldn't be such a big deal because there's food. And then other people said, well, maybe what we need to do is we need to have them work because we can't just give them free things. We need to have them, have them earn it. And so um, we all know these stories about roads that go nowhere. And like in, in Glasloff, there's this beautiful wall that goes around Castle Leslie, and that was built by the Leslie family by paying people during the famine to build this, I think it's like an eight and 10 foot wall. It's a beautiful wall. And a lot of our ancestors did that work. But anyway, so um, they decide that they're gonna put it off. They say we should adjourn until the proper time arrives and then if, if, if it's necessary, we can call a, midi, call a meeting and form a committee. <laughs> Have any of you ever heard anything like that in your lives? <laughs> I mean, this is, this, is, this is out of the newspaper. This is not made up stuff. It sounds like, um, like I made it up before I got here, but there it is. And so um, in the meantime, uh, my family, other families are suffering. They're having a very hard time. And what's really enough, this is May 5th, 1846. Four days earlier, on May 1st, Beltane, the first day of Celtic summer, a great day to celebrate, celebrate rebirth. A ship pulls into Manhattan. On it are something like, uh, I have the number up there, it's 88 passengers who write down, or someone writes down for them because they're literate writes down that they're going to Providence, 88 of them. Now I've traced these people. I've found some of them living on Federal Hill. I've found some of them living in the North End up near um, uh, where Corliss was, was located. Um, Incidentally, Corliss Street used to be called McKenna Street. I, I have a lot of resentment over that. Um, and I, I've never figured out who was named after, but I'd like the name. And, um, and also in the, what's, what was known as the Fifth Ward down along the, along the docks. I've, I've been able to trace them. Um, so here they show up. They knew something was going on because seven weeks before this, before this meeting that their landlords had, these guys were on ships. They knew that there was desperation going on. Um, incidentally, 
Barney McKenna, who at one point I thought was an ancestor. Damn it, he's not. Because he left a paper trail. He left this paper trail. It's great. But Barney, Barney and his wife, Mary, and all their kids. See, Betsy, Peter, Sally, Ann, John, Margaret, and little um, Pat. No, Pat, and there's a, still a younger one. There's Barney, little tiny Barney. Barney was born on the ship. Three women had babies on that ship. This was not a well-planned thing. This wasn't like, hey, you know, next summer, let's take a vacation. No, this was like, this was pretty serious thing going on. Barney incidentally went to work for uh, Philip Allen, he worked at Allen's Print Works, um, which one of the great heroes of, uh, of the Irish. Um, and he worked there for almost 40 years after he arrived. So why did they come to Providence? They came to Providence because opportunity was here. The city itself, this is uh, Providence in 1810. This is, I don't know if you've seen the, the backdrop, it's, it's gorgeous. And this is the, uh, yeah. And so um, it was a Yankee city. There are a few blacks, maybe there was like, you know, three or 4% black people living in the city. Some of them were slaves. There were slaves here until the 1840s or it was into the 1840s because it was grandfather. So they, they kept them around if they, unless they wanted to go free. And um, some of them couldn't afford to go free. But anyway, there was, there was mostly, mostly Yankees. There are a few people coming in from other places like the Azores, like Cape Verde Islands, like the British, British Isles who came in on ships and, but didn't live in Providence. They spent some time there. Um, but the slave trade, which had given Providence and Newport a lot of wealth, and I had a bit of a conversation with, um, what is her name, Brown. Um, what? Not Christina. She, she's written a book about the Brown family. Um, and she and I went back and forth about the role of the slaves with, with the Brown family. Um, they did um, mess around. John Brown did mess around with the slaves. He was very poor at his slave business. Uh, but even if he only had one or two ships that actually tried to do it, uh, the money that was made in Providence came out of slavery. Their trade was coastal trade. It was Caribbean trade. Caribbean trade meant they were trading for um, molasses. Um, coastal trade meant they were trading for, for um, grains and for, for uh, cloth, for, for raw materials. Um, but, the, but the slave trade was coming to an end. 1808, it was going to be kaput. It was going to be illegal. And at the same time, um, there were opportunities um, beginning in, in 1790s, as we know, with, uh, with this fellow, Samuel Slater. 1790, 1791, he's got his plan. 1792, he's got the first uh, integrated, and it was not integrated, he's got the first textile uh, factory in the United States. It's the beginning of the American Re Industrial Revolution. So what he can do in his place is he can make thread, but he can't make cloth. He needs weavers. So what does he do? He recruits a guy named Thomas Robinson from Lurgan. Lurgan is right close to Drew and Clara. It's, um, I don't know, 30 miles away, something like that. And um, Thomas Robinson comes over and then he in turn recruits people because he needs, are you there? Oh. Um, I'll, I'll keep talking and see what happens. Can you hear me back there? Ah. It's not that one. Well, anyway, I will um, keep talking in the meantime. Um, he recruits other people to come over. Now, he may be the beginning of this migration. I've talked with Father Bob Heyman about it, and Bob's not so sure that uh, Thomas Robinson's the beginning of the migration out of uh, South Ulster. Um, I think it might, I think he might be right about it, but at any rate, we do see as early as 1792, people coming from South Ulster who are coming to Providence and the reason they're coming is they have textile skills. 
by 1818, 1820, there's, um, there, there are more than a few in Providence who are now coming out of County Tyrone, uh, County Armagh, Monaghan, this little place, and they're coming to Providence and they're working in textiles. 1827, uh, the Calendar Company, which was located on Sabin Street at the bottom of Federal Hill, recruited a guy named John McKenna, who came from Armagh, right on the border with Tyrone. And they recruited him because he knew how to build the machinery, he knew how to fix the machinery, and apparently he knew how to uh, organize workers. Um, Bob and I are both pretty sure that he was, he was brought in as a general manager. Um, but he certainly was brought in. He was a very important guy. His son um, went on to invent machinery and um, was very, very successful himself. Anyway, clearly by 1827, there is a chain created from this little place in South Ulster and it's coming. Um, here is um, Thomas's, uh, um, um, Thomas's cemetery stone from uh, the North Burial Ground. Instantly, when he died, they, they never used to write obits. When he died in 1808, they wrote it up in the paper. An, a very unusual thing. So just a quick thing about, about Providence. Pro, look at the, the way Providence grew from 1830 to 1870, the numbers. This isn't because Yankees are having lots of kids. As we know, when you become middle class, um, historically, people start having fewer and fewer children. They want to. They have a lifestyle. They want to maintain a lifestyle. So it becomes common to have two kids or three kids rather than five or six or seven kids. This is primarily Irish immigration and Irish Americans being born in Providence. And the city was freaking out. The um, in, in the early period, in the 1820s and 1830s, they hardly even noticed that there were any Irish. By the early 1840s, it was beginning to irritate people. Um, our people did not come in all dressed up and fancy and stuff. They, they were illiterate. Um, a lot of them didn't speak the language. They were poor. They often had ill health because they came on ships that took a long time to come in and they had improper food. Um, by uh, I think it was around 1850, something like 20% of the city was Irish. Wow. So wow. It, was, it was a major change and they were freaking out. So this is what they did. Um, there was this tradition among the English, the English have a lot of wonderful traditions. One of them is um, warning out of people. And what they did is if when somebody came into a community, they had to go and see the, uh, uh, what was he called? He was the- uh, What was he the poor? Overseer, overseer of the, the poor. poor, thank you. Yeah. And they had to go to Overseer of the Poor and prove that they were worthy to stay in town. Oh. <laughs> and 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 incidentally, the Overseer of the, of the Poor got a cut always. Of course. Aside from his salary, he also got a cut on what he was, you know. Where are these? Are they, are they in here? These, these are in, that's a good question. These are in way up in the attic of City Hall. Um, these are the original documents. Um, I saw these right after they had been they had been folded up way back in the 1830s and 40s. They had been folded like this and put in boxes. And it took them. They did this about eight or ten years ago. They took and had, had bought a machine that would allow it the paper to slowly open up because otherwise it would have crumbled. Um, Paul Campbell, um, you may remember Paul. Paul Paul was the one who got that machine. And um, I think I was might have been the first person to, to go through these materials. But these are the actual, these are the notes saying, like this lady here, um, Mary Farrell, she's got six kids. It's Christmas Eve. And they don't think she's worthy. So they're sending her out on her own. And she's with um, Catherine, Patrick, Eliza Maria, uh, Bridget, James. They, 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 they name the six kids. It's not, you know. It's not like anything. They personally say, these kids, little children, aren't worthy of being in this town. Wow. Um, Mary Cotton, um, uh, Mary Met Cotton, was uh, sent out because she was a woman of 
bad fame and ill repute. Um, what I found in these in these documents, there's, there's there, there, I don't know how many hundreds of these things are up there in the files. There are lots of them. But what I found was three categories of people. They were Irish, they were black, and they were Protestant, pros, prostitutes. I almost said Protestants. <laughs> they weren't those now. They didn't throw out no. the um, And the prostitutes. And the prostitutes were almost always Irish or black. Um, but they, they, with all the difficulty they made it for the Irish, they needed the Irish because their factories needed workers. They were desperate for workers. And so, but also there, there might have been, I think there was a little bit of warmth in the hearts of those damn Yankees. Um, so what they did also is they, and these, these are also from archives up in Providence, they um, gave, gave people money for, for fuel or for food. So um, there were men who would deliver wood to people's houses so that they could have, they could um, take care of their families. Um, it's very interesting here. This is 1837 and um, Bridget Conroy, Conry, uh, is given money for, for support for a family. But then a month later, she's given money to bury her baby. They bought, they paid for the the uh, the coffin. There there's tons of these these it's 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 sad, but it's it's as a researcher, it's very good. <laughs> it's uh, so all was not bad. Um, there was plenty to be joyous about. Um, and July fourth, eighteen fifty two, which is famous in the United States because that was when a federal Frederick Douglass gave his famous speech about what it was to be a slave. Um, probably his, his greatest uh, uh, statement in upstate New York. Uh, my family didn't know about it. Um, we didn't read newspapers. We were illiterate. But Peter McKenna, um, who was my great-great-grandfather, married the Dugan's daughter, Catherine. There were three couples at the cathedral that, that day, and um, they were married, and they had a big celebration all day long. They were very lucky because it coincided with a two-day festival. And I was very lucky because the Providence Journal wrote for days about the conditions, the weather, the people. They, the, they said that the trains were loaded with people coming into the city from the towns outside to celebrate. That they were, um, the bells in the churches all through town were ringing. They, they, hired, um, they hired people. And there's one guy, his name's off my list, so I can't think very right I think his name was Donnelly. He was hired for $2 for the day to ring the bell. So all day long, for two days, they're ringing bells. I probably, you know. um, And they had, they had the um, American band did performances. They had parades. They had steamboats doing displays in Narragansett Bay, sailing ships sailing around. And so I like to think that after they were married at uh, the cathedral, um, after uh, Katie came down in, in the carriage and then went back with Peter back up to uh, Spruce Street, um, to Teff Street on, on Federal Hill, that they had a festival all day long. They, they probably sang and drank and um, had, had, had great cheer, great, great crack. Um, anyway. The day was very pleasant. The streets thronged with thousands who came from neighboring towns on and on and on. This is the neighborhood they lived in. Um, this, I, I, have, I have this copy, I have a, an original on the wall. This is the 1875 map of, of Federal Hill. And if you look really closely at it, which you can't see right now, you can see who the owners of the, build, of the houses are. And the Irish were buying up property like crazy. My family wasn't, we couldn't afford it. We actually. Um, rented from a German family who were also immigrants. Very few Germans around, mostly Irish, but uh, one guy one guy was right there. Um, if you go to uh, De Pasquale Square and you walk past from Atwell's Avenue, you walk down to Spruce Street and you just cross Spruce Street, on the left-hand side is the house that my family lived in. It's not there anymore. They they took it. It's gone. It's it's it. The whole Route Six and Route Ten took it away. Um, but it was right there in the corner of Deep Esquali Square. 
and they lived in a family with 20 people. It was a house that I was probably built for, to house two families. There are actually 20 people, nine of them were children, two of them were infants. It consisted of four families and a single, single man. A single man probably rented part of a room from one of them because that's how they, there was, there was no housing. I got some great housing shortage problems um, essays in my, my blog if you're ever looking for it. Now, all of these names are not exclusive to True or Clara, um, but a lot of them are. And what I've been doing for, I don't know, 15 years now is when I find, and you can find this on my website, when I find an Irish name, Malloy, and I can show that the person that Malloy was born in County Roscommon or Leitrim or wherever, by the time of the, the famine, I don't look later on because then you got more people moving around in different parts of Ireland. But if, if they were born there, like McKenna and Monaghan or McKenna and Tyrone, I put the name and I have probably 2,000 examples of names with counties. And I'm only talking about, I'm talking about Northern um, Rhode Island, for the most part, uh, Providence County. And I'm talking about from when they first came over until uh, maybe 1854, 1852, thereabouts. Um, and a lot of these names are exclusive to this area. And incidentally, that's, there's, that's another picture of uh, roses and the kids are walking barefoot. So what do they do when they get here? Well, the calendaring company is one place. Allen's Print Works is another. And the New England Put Butt Company is a, a third place that hires people. Um, the calendaring company in the upper left-hand corner um, had about 250 people working there. This was the one where John McKenna was recruited in 1827 to come in. And he brought in a lot, a lot of other people. One of the people he brought in was another fellow named um, McKenna, Ed McKenna. And Ed McKenna was, was there one day in 1844. This is before the famine. And there was a storm, there was this gale wind, and it, it blew roofs off of buildings. It knocked over chimneys. It, it was a mess. And they had a four-story warehouse, and it collapsed. And he was in the bottom, and he was crushed to death. Uh, Bob Heyman, years ago, sent me uh, a little write-up about this guy. And I emailed him back immediately and showed him the, st the stone in St. Patrick's Cemetery um, that his brother had put up for him. But anyway, um, the, then Alan, um, uh, Philip Allen, who at one point was, was governor of Rhode Island, um, he made a point of hiring Irish people. He had uh, generally about 200 Irish people working for him at any one time, um, including having a guy named McCarthy as his general manager, an Irishman. So he was, he gave, the management jobs as well as regular jobs. He also, when the cathedral was built, he donated the Spanish uh, bell for it. And then a few years later, when St. Patrick's Church was built, he donated that bell as well. So he was a really, he was a good, good guy. Uh, my, my ancestor, Peter McKenna, went to work in this building right here. Um, and this painting in the center, this is owned by Rhode Island Historical Society. It's amazing. It's a painting of the inside of the New England Butt Company. It was painted in 1886. Now, my, my ancestor was no longer working there, but he would have, he would have, if he would, could come back, he'd recognize some of those people working there, the people he worked with. It's, it's a great painting. Um, the, 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 the painting is with the Round Historical Society. The building is on Pearl Street in Providence. And here are some of the things that he built. Um, these uh, butt hinges, that's why they call it New England Butt Company. Butt hinges were, um, they're heavy duty. It was, it was hard work, it was tough work. So that was the men. Um, a lot of women ended up working for um, the well-to-do. Now we all know about no, no Irish need apply, but in the Old Stone Bank project, we've found close to 900 people who um, lived and worked in, in cottages and 
I think it's 53% uh, of them list where they come from in Ireland. So more than half of all the domestic live-in servants were Irish. And that doesn't include the ones where they didn't write down that they were from Ireland. So probably 60 to 65 percent it was were, were Irish Irish servants, which suggests to me that it was a fashion. It was a fashion to have Irish girls and women working in your house. It was also the way that the it was the number one way to give money to support your family or to bring them over was to be a servant because you didn't pay room and board and your costs were little. And so you could save money to bring over siblings, cousins, and, and so forth. I think that was the case with uh, Katie um, Dugan, uh, Catherine Dugan, who um, I didn't know when she came to Ireland, or to, to Providence, until I found in 1847, I found that she was working as a, as a, um, a live-in servant. So she's probably the reason that the rest of the family got over. So if you weren't working for somebody else, you were creating your own job. Thomas Monahan uh, uh, was actually from Monahan, and the company he created went on to, in the 1920s, to build machinery for trucks, and into the 1960s was building parts to go with um, police uh, cars. So, so his blacksmith shop uh, continued um, for 100 years after this ad came out. Francis Hackett was from County Tyrone. Um, if you look, you can see that he has an address on Federal Hill on At Atwells Avenue. He has another one in the North End. Um, he put this ad in right before the, uh, the famine, not famine, the um, Depression of 1873, the panic. They used to call it a panic. Um, terrible depression that happened. Um, he lost his, his uh, place in the North End, but he kept a place on Federal Hill. Mike McKenna had a plot, uh, stucco business downtown, but he lived on the Hill. And then there are the children. And this is a big, big problem. Um, kids came over from the very beginning. Parents were dying after coming off on the, coming over on ships. They weren't dying on the ship necessarily. That did happen but they would arrive and sometimes within a year or two years, they would just, they would destroy it because of the, their health. First with a famine and then with going through um, six, seven weeks in the hold of a ship. Um, the, the, the Catholics, the Irish Catholics created the Hibernian Orphan Society. It was succeeded by other um, groups. Um, same name, different names, same kind of thing going on. Um, there's a group in Providence today that I think is just wonderful called the Children's Friend. And the Children's Friend Society, which was the original name, they were created in the 1830s, I want to say. And um, they took care of so many of the Irish kids. Here are some more of the young, young thugs. You, you know, and I say young thugs because um, they, they, they grew up, they, a lot of times they didn't have families, they didn't uh, have any education, um, they answered uh, any difficulty with their fists. The girls there were doing piecework. One girl there is six years old. And um, this is the uh, reform school, which um, there, were, there were three institutions in the city. There was Dexter Asylum for the uh, indigent. Um, there was Butler Hospital for the insane, and there was the reform school, and, and then, of course, it was a state prison. And in every one of those, Irish people were disproportionately a part of. How many Malloys are uh, this? <laughs> those are all Malloys. Those are all Riley. And when the Civil War came out, and we find this in the in the old stone bank records. Um, they went into the reform school, and just like the Russians are doing now, with going into prisons and saying, "You want to you want to get out of prison?" They went into the reform school, and if the guys would sign a paper, they'd, they'd um, put them into the military right away. And I've got uh, stories of people who who do that, and they're dead at 15 years old. Um, 
very sad, sad story. There were children um, that uh, I, some of these records I found in city archives, some of them I found in the sh children's friends. They have the records, they have the little notes about these kids. And um, for example, Mary and Catherine Driscoll, who were nine and five years old, were living in the woods up on Federal Hill, living in the woods and coming out during the day to gather offal, to uh, beg. And someone found them and brought them first to Dexter Asylum and then said, this is not right for them. And they brought them to the Children's uh, Friends Society and the Children's Friends found places for them to live. Now, it didn't always work out well for people. Um, there was a young girl named uh, Katie Conley. And Katie Conley, the, this, this, this is part of a letter that I, I found in the city archives. Um, one, one October night, Walter Danforth, who, who was going to be the uh, mayor of Providence a couple of years later, he's living in, he's in his nice fancy house, and there's a knock, knock, knock on the door. It's a northeaster, north, nor'easter, nor nor'easter going on. Um, it's it's a horrible, horrible night. Um, he opens the door. There's a little girl. She's 11 years old. Her name's Katie Conley. She is not wearing a bonnet. She doesn't have a coat. She's just there. She's crying and she's asking for her. I think it was her aunt, aunt or cousin, a, a Mac, 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 McElroy, and because she was, a, she was a live in servant there. And Katie had left the house because her parents were beating her. And, and so Danforth takes, him in, takes her in. Um, Mrs. Danforth gives her a hot bath. They get, get her in clothes. And the next day he writes a letter to the, the city fathers and says, can we please get this girl into the Children's Friends Society? This girl needs help. Well, I come over to the Children's Friends Society and they write, they wrote the notes about them. And this is what they, they say, they say, but Katie is a wicked, naughty girl, um, dishonest, great uh, rambler. Yeah. Anyway, um, they, they try to get her into the to reform school, but they can't find her because she has this habit of going out on pilgrimages. She runs away all the time. So what's the truth? Is she the sad, is it the poor girl who's a victim or is she trouble? It's probably both. These were really screwed up kids. There, were, there weren't easy answers. I traced um, her a little bit later. I have no idea what she ended up with, but boy, broke my heart when I read, when I read about her. Another problem they had was prostitution. That was the, the most financially remote, remote, <laughs> Um, successful thing you could do if you're a woman, but also the most costly thing you could do if you're a woman. Um, a, a woman named uh, Catherine Hamilton was running a, 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 a whorehouse on, on Knight Street, um, just down the road from uh, McElroy's pig farm um, on Federal Hill. They were, they, were still doing, they were still doing agriculture up there. Okay? Was, the town still had um, cows running around and stuff. Anyway, um, this is really an interesting story because I looked for all the newspapers don't seem to have anything about it. Providence Journal doesn't touch it. And yet the police force sent out people, their guys at night, and they're sitting there in the dark and they're watching carriages come in. They're watching people come and go. But then they, they're asked to testify uh, legally. What did you see? Well, I don't know because I, I don't know exactly what was going on. But so you have these, these cops they're acting like, oh, I don't want to be associated with this, but I'm telling you what's going on. Um, they, uh, Catherine Hamilton is ordered to come before the city fathers where she's going to be warned out. And she disappears. There's a lot of paperwork on this. Um, why doesn't it show up in the newspapers? Who is going to Catherine Hamilton's house? I think the, yeah. I won't, I won't keep you too long because I know I'm getting a little wordy here. I think I've been wordy from the beginning. Um, I'm not going to touch the church. I was hoping that uh, Father Bob Heyman would be here because he can talk about the church. Um, but this guy, uh, James Donnelly, came. He later became the Bishop of Clara, um, where we're talking about up in uh, southern uh, South Ulster. But he came as a young father, young priest, 
Um, he was there to raise money for the Catholic University in Dublin. They could now have their own university where uh, now they could actually educate their people. They wanted to have a um, proper college for them, university for them. And he lived in Providence for a couple of months. And he was, he, he was very impressed with Providence when he came. He talked about how, uh, how it was Yankee dumb in earnest. It was just this beautiful, beautiful place with uh, efficiency and, and nice houses. The women were independent. They actually rode their own buggies. Uh, he, things he didn't like though, he didn't like the fact that Irish men particularly got into fights. He found it embarrassing. He found it, he was embarrassed to be among those people when they, in front of Yankees. He also, because there was a tradition that still exists today of women keening at, at, at wakes and funerals. And he was opposed to that because the Yankees didn't do it. He was very uh, prudish himself, very, very puritanical. Um, and he was, he was upset. They shouldn't be looking, they have to, they have to act like Yankees. Um, anyway, he, he left a, um, a diary, which is, is pretty cool. And then uh, when the war breaks out in Civil War, young Irishmen do what they've done in all the wars in the past is they, they volunteer. Um, this fellow, John Sheridan, um, Natalie's not here tonight, is she? Oh, Natalie! Natalie McKenna. And I'm sorry to say that we're not relatives. We share a last, we share a surname. Uh, but Natalie, uh, found, I guess I wrote something in the Providence Journal one time and Natalie wrote to me um, about her uh, great uncle or great great uncle named John Sheridan. And this poor young man at, um, and Natalie can, can uh, help me out, but he was like 18 or 19 years old and he joins the army, he joins the, uh, the first round cavalry. He is, um, goes through a bunch of battles. He's at Chancellorville, he's at um, the second bull run. He's captured and he's brought to uh, the prison in Richmond, which was really horrible. It wasn't as bad as Andersonville, but it was a very bad prison with all open, like the air would just blow through and, and like in winter time and um, it was really cold in summertime, it was hot and it was just horrible. And they crowded the people in. He was traded for some uh, Confederate uh, POWs and he comes home, he marries a young woman and then he volunteers to go back to the battle. And he's in the battle, the battle of Foggy Bottom, that's what it's called. And He's shot in his thigh and it hits, it hits his femur. He's, um, he should have survived, but back then if you were shot like that, that was it. He lingers in a hospital for, for a small while and then he's dead. Very, it's, his family mourned him for years because Natalie told me about uh, growing up when she was a little girl and uh, her father would take her down to the sailor, the soldiers and sailors monument right across from city hall. And there was the name of John Sheridan. And also there was the name of his brother, who I think was James maybe. And he went somewhere else. He, yeah. Ah, all right. So Natalie's given me a new story to, to write about as a coal miner. So I'm going to look into that. Um, now, there was another um, Irish fellow, another McKenna, as it happens to be, um, named John McKenna. And his right before he died, his father Owen McKenna died. They lived on on Federal Hill, and um, John John joined the um, the Third Rhode Island Heavy Artillery, and he was captured and brought to Andersonville. And Andersonville was a very large at its at its biggest. It was twenty six acres, 
It started out a little bit smaller than that. It was all wide open, surrounded by uh, stockades. They didn't have, they had whatever they could make to cover themselves up. They didn't have tents, they didn't have houses. They were outside, daytime, nighttime. I took this photograph. This was a stream that came down through the center, still does through the center of Andersonville. And Confederate men would despoil it by urinating and shitting up above. And when people were desperate, they would crawl there, they would drink, and they would get dysentery and they'd die. And John Anderson, uh, John uh, McKenna died there. He's buried in an unmarked grave. Um, there's, a, there's a stone that has his name on it, but it's just there. If you were, if you were captured there, if you were, if you were a prisoner there, you would some of them would volunteer to bury people because they would get to walk outside the stockade and maybe find some food or maybe just get away from the crowd, get some fresh air while they buried these people in mass graves. And John, John was there. Um, his mother and siblings, um, I think I wrote about them. Um, it must've been so sad for her the years after, after that happened, losing both your husband and then your son to war. And the war ends, and so new businesses pop up. Uh, James Murphy, I've talked to uh, descendants of his, had a very um, successful business on De uh, Dean Street. Charles McCaughey was uh, Irish, was American born. His father was from County Tyrone. Uh, Patrick McAvey, um, aside from having a grocery store, had a very big uh, construction company. He got the contract to build uh, St. St. John's on Atwells Avenue. And Michael uh, Golrick down at the bottom, he got the contract, the subcontract from McAvey to do the roofing for the, for the church. And then in the upper right-hand corner, you can see Mark Golrick, Michael's son, and Mark Golrick, American-born, um, opened up a shop with an English fellow um, a dry goods store. It didn't work out well. You can see him, see him standing, he's so proud. There's a short guy on the left. He's got a straw hat on, he's looking proud. He's so happy to have that business. It failed, but he was so charming. He got a job working for the, the city with meat inspection. And he went around and he gave talks. And I swear, I've, read, I've found these articles where the women of Providence would go to his talks to see him. They were swooning over the guy. And I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. They were swooning over this guy. He was, he was a charmer. So the, so the war is over. People begin to respect Irish people a little bit. So now they can become things like cops. They weren't allowed to be cops or firemen before that. Well, volunteer firemen, they could be. Um, and um, so new opportunities were coming. Now, some people did very, very well. Uh, Gil Bain, uh, George M. Cohen, uh, Patrick McCarthy. But for the most part, people still lived an ordinary life. Now, my family was still living up there when Federal Hill became Little Italy. This, in 1892, um, Providence Journal, they have a little cartoon and it says Little Italy. There were probably 40% of the people who were still Irish living there. My family was. Acorn Street in 1903, my um, grandfather, my great grandfather was raising his family there. Um, here is 1915 and Mike Halloran has got a uh, blacksmith shop right there on Atwills Avenue. His uh, descendant, uh, who's also Michael, um, gave me those access to those photographs, they're fantastic. And so here we are, we're now in the early 1920s. And the question is, as far as Federal Hill goes, what's left? Just memories, memories and ghosts. There's Trainer Street. Trainer is uh, one of the most popular names in, uh, uh, in, in South Ulster. Um, the original story of the McKenna's, the McKenna came up chasing a stag from County Meath, meets uh, the daughter of the king there, whose name is Trainer. They get married and, and everything is hunky-dory. Um, 
I believe that story, eighth, eighth century, has to be true. And also McAvoy, now there's a restaurant there called Pana e Vino, and that is in what was Thomas McAvoy's house. At least that's what I think it is. I've tried to get in to talk to them, but without it. But there's one other place. There's one place where the famine generation still speaks, and that is St. Patrick's on Douglas Avenue. You can see the Dugan Stone is down in the right-hand corner, James and Ellen and their son, Patrick. Patrick came over, raised money to bring the family over, got tuberculosis, uh, and died at the age of 29. Uh, or no, he was 19. He was 19 years old. So if I can slide this up, I want to leave you with something here. Come on, scroll down. Scroll down. I apologize for being like this. So there was this fellow named Patrick Campbell. And when he died, damn it, sorry. No, down. I'm certainly not going to remember. Okay, let's do it this way. Nothing like losing control over your technology. Huh? All right, I lost it. Anyway, basically what he said on his stone was that it was such a shame for him to come so far and to die among strangers. If you go to um, St. Patrick's Cemetery, which is fantastic, the thing that's going to stand out to you, you're going to see on so many stones, it says where they were born. And the reason they, the families didn't have money, they spent the money to put where they were born because they never intended to come. And they still felt in their hearts that that's where they were from. So you'll find people from Ergel True, from Clara, from um, Ergel Kieran, I think it's called. I think my pronunciation is terrible. Um, and and these, are, these stones tell you the story of, of, of these people. Um, anyway, I thank you very much. And um, if you want to know more. Yeah. Well, I thought it was a fabulous talk. Thank you. I'm glad that I came. Um, I'm curious as to where that uh, St. Patrick is. I'm a nutmegger like you. Yeah. Only been out like 16 years. I am not a nutmegger. This yeah. fellow accused me of being a nutmegger. Um, <laughs> I'm a Rhode Islander. I live in Connecticut. But, <laughs> but, I, but I have been known to talk to nutmeggers. So, so, so I'll talk to you. So you're from Connecticut. Where? Where in Connecticut are you from? I have Summers, not far from you. I oh, I, no, I, I used to bicycle from my house up to Summers and you, many hills to get you there. You in Stafford? Or, or? Uh, I'm in Tallinn. Oh, yeah. next door. Yep. Uh, anyway. Where is that, that St. Patrick's? I'd like to take a little Oh, little my goodness. It's, it's, on, um, it's on Douglas Avenue in the city. And it is absolutely, it's absolutely fantastic. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic. Um, what you're going to see when you go there, too, is you're going to see so many people who are from Monaghan or Tyrone, particularly Tyrone. It's such a concentration. That cemetery is the cemetery of the famine generation. After that, you have St. Francis, where you still have some famine people, but then you have them coming after. And you've got St. Anne's coming after, but St. Patrick's, I think the last burial was in, well, they have buried them recently, but the la they, they closed it officially, I think in 1888. Wow. So the first, the first one was in 1844, I think. And he was, um, he got killed on the job. That's, a lot of them end up that way. He was, I, um, I write about it in my, my blog, if you remember the details. Um, but yeah, it's it's if you haven't been there, it's 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 a great place. Yeah. Um, can you say um, that St. Patrick's Cathedral is protection? <laughs> um, I was talking to, and I, I apologize, I uh, didn't hear her name when we were talking. But ah, hello there. Um, one of the things that I wanted to do very badly, and I brought a group over to the to the cemetery one time, uh, sometime last year, to discuss what could be done. There were about six of us there. Um, one person was an expert on restoring cemeteries. And he said that there are 
thousands of stones right under the surface. And these stones, they don't, they're not like in most cemeteries where it says born and died. They say born in the parish. Sometimes they even say the townland, but usually they say the parish. So dig up those stones and there is a, a tremendous history there. Aside from the fact that it's also, it's a beautiful place and it should be taken care of because it is our ancestors. Now, I wanna tell you, I, I wanna take a lot of credit as a Rhode Islander, um, promoting Irish travel to, to Providence. I actually, um, Larry McDermott, who, uh, and you probably met Larry, he was the uh, head of the Clara Historical Society. He and his son came to Providence because of my writing. They came on holiday to, to yes, and I, I, I got to take them on a tour of St. Patrick's and other places around the city. Um, so I'm, I'm promoting up, up to two people so far. Um, and and we, were, we were in the cemetery, he says, look, look at the Hawthorne tree. So the Hawthorne tree, the fairy tree, which is there to look after, yes. And it's the, it's the fairy tree, they, they, they will take care of the dead. They look after them. If you don't break their branches, they break their branches, they'll break your legs. Yeah, don't cut it down. And you know, I used to look at that hawthorn tree and hawthorn trees look kind of scrawny. And, and they have briars and stuff like that. And he said, no, that's a fairy tree. That tree is pro was probably planted there in the 1850s or 60s or 70s. So it's probably 150 years old. They live to be 400 years old. Um, Sheila would like to know, um, are there more records from Old Stone from early 1900s? Um, the Old Stone, Sheila, the Old Stone records go from, eight, the ones that, that have information we can use, go from 1844 to 1897. The early records in 1840s don't tell us much, but the records we're now, um, in the 1867 and 1868 for the most part. Um, and they're now putting down where people are born, they're putting down their occupation, they're putting down their, their employer's name, they're putting down uh, who their cousins are sometimes or their relatives. Um, the material is tremendous. Sometimes they'll tell you that somebody is missing a leg or they're missing an eye or they stutter or, because what they did is you, when you went in and you wanted to get a bank, account, they didn't say, where's your photo ID? Um, <laughs> what they had to do is they had to get information. So they said, uh, tell me where you were born. Okay, I was born in County Monica. And tell me something else. And they write that down. So when you come back to take out money, uh, you say, okay, I'm, I'm Ray McKenna. I'm from County Monaghan. I live on Teff Street. And then, they, then, then it operates. And they might say, well, um, Let's see, oh yeah, it says here he's bald. <laughs> so it must be him. Um, they, they did, they, they put down, they put down the stuff. They put down all kinds of comments. Oh, the first one I found, just one second, but the first compliment, because in the beginning, it's like they're just saying your name and your address. Then this young Irish girl comes in and the young man, I, I, I did a little research on this banker. He was like 26 years old, maybe he's 22, he's a young guy. And she comes in and no descriptions at all. And the first description is she has uh, red hair and fair eyes. Oh. Or something to that, that effect. <laughs> yeah, it's right there. I think it's fair also to mention that those records specifically have a lot of information on the women which you do not get when you're doing genealogy research. So you may find something where it says she's the mother of, or she's the sister of, or the, you know, and it, it's fabulous, fabulous to get, but that is one of the hardest things, especially for Irish women. <laughs> yeah, you know, the, um, up until the Old Stone Bank records, for me to track people in, when I say Providence, I mean Rhode Island, but, but, the concentration was in Providence. Um, for me to track people before we got into the old stone bank records, um, the stones in, in places like St. Patrick 
allowed me to see that someone was born in, in Clara or Erigel True. Um, naturalization records sometimes would have the, the uh, parish, but they would, and sometimes they would have the county. Very often they have the county. That's probably the most important. Um, the newspapers, the uh, Boston Pilot, when people gave, when they raised money for different charities, they would put in the name, all the names of the people in, in the counties they came from. So that's all you had. And now in the old stone bank records, I've got 8,000 names linked to a county. And probably more than half of those are women. So women did not become naturalized in the 19th century. So if you if you found out that so-and-so was, you, you know, man might be from County Monaghan, we had no idea where his wife was unless it came up in a rare thing. Now I've got 8,000. So you guys, when you start looking, go there and then come back again because we're going to find even more. We're going to have 12,000 12, or more names with specific places. I found one recently. He put down the town land. And I wrote to a guy. I put it on, on, on True uh, Facebook True page. And a guy wrote back to me and said, he said, wrote back and he sent me the picture of the farm. And wow. he sent me the picture of the map from um, 1826 or 1856 or something. Amazing. The map that the guy of the, the farm. So, and I found another one where the guy was from County, was from Sligo. And I was able to actually get down to like two patches of land. He's either from this patch or that patch. Um, it's extraordinary what comes out of six words or seven words on a page. Can you just explain a little bit about the old stone records? Because I don't know anything about it. And yeah, in 18, in 18, uh, 16 or 17, um, in, in Boston, they opened up a uh, bank where people could make small donations and open bank accounts. Up until then, banks really like, you know, I need, I need a few hundred dollars from you if you want to invest. Um, and now you can go down with five cents or 10 cents and you could open up an account and you could put in a nickel a week. Remember, how many of us had Old Stone Bank or yeah. uh, Christmas clubs? Yeah. yeah, we had your little bank accounts and yeah. you put the money in every week. Um, they were, this was, this was the first place in Boston. Two years later, Providence copies or, or is inspired and opens up what became the Old Stone Bank. And so this is why it's so important for the little guy, for the immigrants. And Beth, I'm not sure the percentage of immigrants, but it's huge. Oh, it's, huge. it's huge. It's very rare that you don't, I, I can't even tell you how much, what the percentage is. So these bank records are there. Fortunately, uh, Ray convinced the Rhode Island Historical Society to let us volunteers actually in our own homes uh -huh. we pull up a page and we're translating wow. and we're just putting it into spreadsheets. And the spreadsheets are all available on his website. So you can go in there and look at an Excel spreadsheet and control F or find and say, I want to find you know, Mahoney. I want to find. And you can go through every year that we've done so far. So we're doing it as of, uh, how many of us are there? Yes, maybe 20. It's probably We've done over forty thousand. Yeah, we're, we're we're just shy of forty four thousand. Lately, lately we've been doing about in the last um, I would say last two or three months we've been doing about three thousand a month. Um, and um, yeah, it, it's it, the the material is just just incredible. So 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 in eighteen forty four, in the middle of eighteen forty four, they start. That's when we have the signature books. Maybe they, they probably had them before that. They don't, we don't know where they are. Signature book, that's where you put your name in. And so you can also tell, find out if a person's literate or not, because a lot of times it's an X. And then with, as time goes on, and first 1844, it's a small city. I showed you the, uh, the numbers before. Um, as a city gets bigger and bigger, now you need to, you need more detail. You can't just, oh, I remember that guy, he lives down on, you know, Snow, Snow Street. Um, so now they start adding more and more detail. And I've looked a little bit in the 1890s. In the 1890s, they start putting up, they're, they're putting down parents' names and all kinds of stuff. Um, but even now in the 1860s, the material is there. And the women, even in the 1840s, you can, they're not putting any information down, 
but it'll, it has a street address. And if you look at the street address, you see that Mr. Brown is living there. So why is um, Bridget O'Hara living with Mr. Brown? <laughs> ah, and you start to see very quickly, these are servants. So we found more material in the early years about women than anything else, about Irish women in particular. And you're going to give us your website information. Um, it's Federal Hill, Irish. That's where my, my family lived there for four generations. Fifth generation moved to uh, far away to uh, Mount Pleasant. <laughs> <laughs> lived next to the Malloys. <laughs> and, uh, nice curtains. <laughs> then... Uh, and then, and then um, I'm the sixth generation, and you know, I bopped around a little bit because we were the generation where people left the city. Um, but four generations living on Federal Hill, so it's federalhillirish.com. Excellent. And if you guys have stories, I'm, I'm always collecting new stories. Like Natalie's given me some very good stories, very great story about John Sheridan. So uh, any other questions? Well, thank you so much. Very good.